All right, we are live. This is Darren Blonsky with Sonoma Wealth Advisors. And I'm Chris Sipes. Back for another riveting, exciting, on the economy where we talk all about the charts and things. Nice that, shirt. Yeah, nice shirt. It matches today, Chris. That's for you, Joe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure during this session, if Joe watches, he's going to send me text messages. <laughs> yeah, your yeah. shirts are matching. <laughs> so we'll call it out first. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, glad to be here. Lots going on as always. I think we have 56 charts tonight, so uh, mm -hmm. we'll try and cruise through them as fast as we possibly can. Uh, before we get started though, as always, I have to say that this is for educational purposes only. So what does that mean? That means that we have no idea who's watching this and we have no idea what your individual financial situation is. So it would be make no sense for you to take this as advice and to act on anything we say. This is part of our due diligence process that we work at as a firm and going through the charts, understanding economically on a weekly basis what's happening out there. So we take this time to share it with you and what we see because it's helpful for our clients and people who are interested. So that's what we're doing. That's what we'll be talking about. We love to start off with a little meme action because that makes life more interesting and fun. And mm -hmm. let's be real. That's the way life is these days. So uh, this is just kind of a joke last week. So Jerem Powell, the, uh, the Fed chair, uh, basically saying all clear to the markets uh, when he came out and, uh, you know, let's keep going with this pushing this bubble. As someone would say it's a gambling bubble. Uh, and we're certainly seeing that and we're, and we're hearing and we heard uh, um, Fed Bullard chair, um, President, uh, St. Louis Fed President say that they're expecting a six and a half percent GDP growth unemployment down to four and a half percent this year. I mean, that's just unbelievable. I feel like I'm living in China um, because those are the numbers they use when they talk about their GDP, which all of us on the market go, oh, those are fake. Those aren't real. But yep, here we are. Uh, in the planned economy of the United States of America, we are planning for a 6.5% GDP this year at the Fed level. So that should be interesting. That means we're probably going to see a very rambunctious year in the economy, um, perhaps in the markets to follow. I wanted to show this this chart tonight because I came across it. And the, uh, where, where this chart came from is there's this uh, Tracy Alloway, who uh, does this Odd Lots podcast, posted this avocados and bit bitcoin pricing trying to say that bitcoin's in a bubble because avocados haven't gone up like bitcoin has with inflation and then one of the people on twitter responded back to this well i mean duh horses versus pelican pelican so as you can see horses have done very well between 1920 and 2020 um, pelican <laughs> pelicans not so much they've struggled well, you know, correlation, uh, causation, yeah. So we got to be careful there. So whenever we go through this data, uh, you, one thing doesn't necessarily lead to the other. And when we're looking at this data, it's a matter of sifting it, understanding it, shaping the way we understand it to influence our overall investment um, perspective and strategy uh, in the markets. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the big conversations in the markets right now is inflation versus deflation and so this was from hedge eye um, where they're talking about this is the elephant in the room right and you know even though it's not coming through so far in the official cpi numbers there's a few things that all of us purchase from time to time that we're noticing uh, quite the increase in prices on so it is definitely popping up in places here and there so far the fed is saying that that is transient that is the word that they like to use for it transient and so we'll see if that's the case yeah it's transient that we're going to see it for a little bit and then it's gone uh you know the thing is with the cpi index they don't include the price of food and the price of energy in the cpi index which are two like the most impactful in our day-to-day -day life uh, costs, right? You think of gasoline to heat our home, well, to heat our homes, or gasoline to drive our cars. Think about the food we eat. They're not including those. So mm -hmm. when they look at CPI and say, "Hey, we're really waiting to see this move uh, before we believe there's real inflation," mm, we feel it before the CPI feels it. One of the thing and factors that they really watch in the CPI calculation is the wages and our wages going up and we're not seeing much wage increase at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you typically don't see wage increases until you get unemployment that's lower. With unemployment where it's at right now and 
I wouldn't expect to see too much wage pressure until we get to about four and a half percent. Then I would expect we would start seeing that wage pressure and then maybe the Fed will admit we have inflation by the time we're all feeling it in our food, in our oil and gas uh, yeah. substantially and not the to other, mention our lumber. Yeah. Well, the, one of the other things they include in that is the owner's equivalent rent, right? So what basically uh, the price that people pay in rent that they would have to pay uh, to own that same property. And with rent prices going down, which are kind of all skewed with the rent moratoriums and everything in the different cities, we saw some charts on that, I think the week, last week or the week before. Um, but rent rent prices have actually been going down, which is kind of throwing, throwing off that CPI. So, so we tell you not to take specific investment advice from us. Definitely don't take dating advice from us either right darren <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so true. she says take me somewhere expensive only a finance lady might find this you know uh funny <laughs> yeah. so obviously we've seen some really intense uh price appreciation in the lumber business uh we're seeing a lot of supply shortages in construction trades that does bode potentially as a headwind um, for uh, the overall construction side of the business, home building, etc., because they're just struggling to get supplies in. Yeah. Came across so, these this week. These were cool, I thought. Yeah, the cognitive biases, which we all fall into. I think one of the things that's interesting is um, uh, Danny Kahneman is a famous economist uh, and, and psychologist that was – made a lot of these popular. I don't know if he discovered them all or most of them, but um, Kahneman and Traversky were the ones that kind of popularized these, at least in the circles that we've been exposed to. And I thought one of the things that he said in an interview was so interesting is that even when you know that you are falling victim to one of these, you still can't really pull yourself out of it, right? And I think that's why it's important to have somebody that can help tell you the truth right whether it's a friend or a guide like you know darren i know you're using a a a trainer for your running like do you really need it you might be able to do it by yourself but sometimes it's good to have somebody there that can just kind of notice things about you that maybe you're not noticing about yourself or you don't want to admit about yourself right and and these cognitive biases definitely affect all of us myself included um, and can have a negative impact on our investing if we allow it. Yeah, it's interesting. I use I use a coach on my running, so he'll set my training schedule for the week. Um, in addition, I use a professional coach that helps me with all the business stuff that we deal with day in, day out. And I'm a huge believer in creating uh, those not only accountability aspects in our lives, but also hiring people that have different perspective, right? And the way you you get out of a lot of these cognitive biases that lead you down these rabbit holes in life are using people and trusting other people who have a different perspective and see things differently. You know, one we see a ton is this one up here called anchoring. So mm-hmm. anchoring is when you're, you know, relying on a certain price you got in your mind. I'm going to $800,000 is what I want my portfolio to be. And if it goes below that, I'm going to freak out. It goes above that. I'm going to be okay. And you're anchoring that 800 as long as I have 800. And we see this happen with investors a lot. And then they make short term decisions that don't pay out well for them because they're anchoring to that specific number or you know you might inherit we see this actually happen a lot with inheritances where people might inherit some money and they might inherit a hundred thousand dollars and they say well i can't lose this hundred thousand dollars and they're so fearful about putting volatility into the portfolio that they don't let it grow um Mm -hmm. so it's kind of an interesting um uh, way of looking at it i am uh and speaking of which, during if you hear some construction noise, I have the contractor here. And I hear him just turn on this saw. I'm like, no, not now. So I'll try and mute throughout if I hear anything. Sounds good. Yeah, there's a lot of them that we can fall victim to. And this is one of them, right? So, uh, you know, you hear a lot about the fact that we're all afraid of like terrorism, even though there's like way higher chance that you're going to get in a car wreck than you're going to be affected by a terrorist, right? And And when you look at like, Um, mosquitoes actually kill more humans every year and have killed way more humans throughout history than pretty much anything else in the world, right? But what are we afraid of? Sharks, right? So we're afraid of like the immediate and the bad and we build these things up in our head. Um, And it looks like that's that has happened with COVID as well, where we actually think the chances of being hospitalized are much higher than they, they really are. And this, of course, skews it by 
politics, which even adds another spin on it for, for folks to get all charged up about. Well, you know, we, we've been pounding the table at least for six months now not to let your politics get involved with your investing because it'll lead you astray. And here's another really classic example of how politics skew belief. And we all have to be careful of this. We all have to watch it. Uh, it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you hang out on. Uh, this chart I came across, which is really fascinating and really sad all at the same time. And this shows who Americans spend their time with by age. And you can see how pretty much um, as people get older, um, they're spending more time alone mm -hmm. than anything. And But I thought that it was really interesting and impactful uh, from a socioeconomic standpoint. And you think about how people vote, how people believe what they believe what they look at um, from, you know, economically what's important to them kind of boils down to this, right? You could take each of these categories based upon different age and make an inference on what might be important to this segment of the population. And as our population ages in the United States, um, you know, there's that whole theory of the, the um, uh, you know, rodent in a python where the rodent's swallowing it or the ro python swallowing a rodent and you can see it moving through the belly of the python mm -hmm. and you have the baby boomer population with that's really moving through the economy right now and a lot of the implications of what that portion of the population is buying not buying how they're spending their time is going to impact all of us in our investments um, in particular um, pertaining to this discussion and one of those really i think prominent themes that we're going to be seeing and we're starting to see already is this idea that there's a lot of pent up demand for experience we've mm -hmm. all been locked in our cages or homes as we call them for uh you know a year now and there's this pent up demand that people want to go out and experience things have different experiences and i think that's what you're going to start seeing in the stock market and with different um, investments that will perform in certain ways because of that pent up demand and demand and we saw this kind of happen in miami over the weekend right where you had in miami you had these you know, tw this was the 20-somethings group. They went out and just partied so hard, they had to literally shut the streets down because mm -hmm. it was just an absolute mayhem. And it, it was a mayhem different than the mayhem we saw last spring when we saw all the protests. Now we're seeing this, like, jubilee, this just total party, YOLO, you only live once kind of attitude flying all over the place. And so we put up this YOLO slide today because... There's this theme happening out there economically, like you only live once, we want to live it up. And this came from the Wall Street Bets crew, and this is the, the term they throw around on their, um, their board around, hey, just put all your money into one stock, GameStop, and just see what happens to it because this is your chance to get make it rich. And you kind of have that energy happening with all of the population on some level, right? Because people are just pent up from not having the experience um, mm -hmm. or experiencing life. Well, it's not only like let's let's do it to get rich, but let's also do it to stick it to the man slash against the establishment or the institutions, right? And and there's an element to that that you're seeing in, in the Miami uh, situation, uh, the Wall Street bets situation, right? Where it's just this kind of attitude of like you said, Darren, where it's like I don't have anything to lose, really. Like I'm I'm gonna spend my time with this experience, but also this experience of like seeing what I can do to stick it to the man, right? And let the chips fall where they may. Well, it's really that theme you've heard me talk about over and over and over. people kind of make fun of me about it when I talk with clients. So I must be saying it a lot when I talk about the fourth <laughs> turning, right? And this yeah. idea that you have one of the, the key factors in the fourth turning is this questioning of institutions. And I was sharing with you, Chris, this, there's this uh, in Instagram, there's this kind of like meme channel I follow called No Gas. And it's just people doing stupid stuff. I don't know why I find it funny, but I laugh at stupid stuff. So I don't know what that says about me. But anyway, so I was watching this one, one kind of um, little video that they would, these cops were in Miami and they busted this kid and they put him in, uh, they put him in handcuffs and put him in the back of the cop car. And so then the cops went to deal with a couple others, people were being out of hand and some of the other kids came over and they were like in their 20s. They opened the door to the cruiser and the kid with his handcuffs jumps out of the cruiser and bolts. And he didn't look like he's like this, you know, kid that was mischievous. He looked like, you know, some kid that they're going to be calling their mom pretty soon. Who didn't, he looked mm -hmm. like a well-adjusted nice kid. And the uh, he's full on sprinting away from the cops in these handcuffs. But what's so interesting about this moment 
is the whole mob of people followed him and made it virtually impossible for the cops to chase him back down and get him in the cruiser because he was surrounded by hundreds of other people on the beach. And that's the kind of shift I think you have uh, on a higher uh, socio level where people just don't respect the institution. It's like, they're not going to like push cops or do anything like overtly awful, but we'll get in the way of letting you do your job anymore because there's mm -hmm. no respect for the institution. And I think you're seeing that in all kinds of walks and aspects of the economy. Yeah. Right. Well, it's it's easy to see why when you, you know, we talked about Newsom, you know, telling everybody to stay locked down and then going to dinner. And then you yeah. on the other side, you've got Ted Cruz flying to Mexico when his state's in a state of emergency. So you can't really blame people for looking at these institutions like, well, there's no authentic leadership. Right. That So why should I listen to these guys? Um, so I, I think that it is a it is definitely going to be a theme uh, and an investment theme moving forward, as you said. Um, so we saw, uh, you know, continued bullishness in the sentiment indicators this week, at least from the uh, the retail side. Um, the, the CNN fear and greed index is a little bit more neutral. I think that one may be updated a little bit more often where the uh, the AII one is only updated once a week. I would venture to guess the 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 AII one when that comes out on Thursday will probably be a little less bullish since we've seen a pullback in the markets this week after the the Fed meetings. Um, we'll see. It's more of a uh, a lagging indicator on that one. So one of the real important things we watch when we're looking at overall uh, themes moving forward is flows. So where is the money moving? These yeah. flows into equity funds. Well, in important caveat. Important caveat to note, and I wish that I, I was going to note it somewhere on here, but I didn't want it to look bad. Uh, that's an annualized number. So basically, if you took the first, you know, three months or so, and then if those flows continue, that would be the annualized number. So that's really important to note with that. That's with really that important. But if you look at this trend and it continues, yeah. I mean, there's, and, and we can go back and we've showed this in many other weeks where there's so much dry powder right now. Yes, yes. That these money markets, if people start flowing that into the equity funds, that could be very bullish for the market. Right. But people are also very skittish right now, too. Um, we, at least, I would say, um, every other couple of days talk with clients and potential clients with massive amounts of cash in their bank accounts because mm -hmm. they're very nervous about putting it into the markets. Yeah, I, I, uh, this is the leading economic index for from the conference board. And uh, so that is, is continuing to look pretty strong. The coincident index is like, you know, what's happening right now, that where the LEI is what it's expected to happen. As you can see, there's a little bit of a correlation here. Um, and although the LEI tends to looks like have much more variation than the coincident indi indicators. So those LEIs are really important to look for um, what might happen next in the economy. Albeit a little bit of a rounding going on here, right? You know, not quite the steep uh, recovery. Basically, right. no movement on the labor side. We were staying yeah. where we thought employment. We still staying in that seven to 800 range that we've been in for a while. And this is interesting that, you know, even though you're getting these openings, um, it, they're still taking a long time to fill because there's just not the, uh, the skilled labor that these companies are looking for, especially in the housing industry. I mean, that seems like that is just gangbusters right now. And there's just not enough, um, not enough of those skilled workers to fill those positions at the moment. Well, this is a really big component of modern monetary theory, actually. And, and part of what creates these lags in unemployment is you all these people become unemployed when you have a down period of time in the economic climate. They stay out of the workforce for a while. They then don't renew their skills. They don't have the skills and they become untrained. And so getting them back into the workforce is very, very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're seeing here is these trades. And there was a shortage in the trades prior to COVID. And now that certainly seems to be uh, blossoming even more. Yeah. So, hey, if you don't like school, there's a lot of good jobs in the trades. Definitely. Definitely. Well, it also goes back to like our society, Chris. I think 
overemphasizes education as, and I don't believe in education. I got more certifications than any human should have. <laughs> and I probably have attended more school than is probably healthy for me or anyone else around me. But the, but, but not, it's not everybody's thing, right? And then it doesn't have yeah. to be everybody's thing. It's my thing because I love it. But right. I love learning. But not everybody loves that. And some people are yeah. really good in the trades. And you know, we've kind of developed this society where everyone has to go to college, everyone has to get a degree, and then we've really shortchanged the trades. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that, that's not going to be replaced by an app, most likely. If your toilet explodes in the middle of the night, <laughs> yeah. there's not an app for that, right? Yeah. Um, Thus, the contractor upstairs fixing exactly. the and pounding on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I didn't want to bring up a sore subject, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so a question with the, with the stimulus checks is, are those going to funnel into the market, or like you said, Darren, are are those stimulus checks going to uh, you know party in Miami for a week, right? And I don't know. I, I definitely don't have any data to back this up, but I would say anecdotally, just talking to people, it feels more like you know I just got vaccinated and we're flying to somewhere, you know, right? Is what you're hearing a lot of, and so it's going to be really interesting to see if that stimulus money actually goes into the day trading and continue to see the call options trading and all this stuff that we've seen off the charts over the last year. Or if people are like, you know what, I've had my fun with that. I'm going to go to Vegas and gamble properly, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> gamble and cigarette smoke rather than in my basement. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so I think that's that's a story that's going to be interesting to follow, along with what happens with rates, and that's been the major story over the last couple of weeks. This is the drawdowns in the long term, long dated Treasury index. So, think twenty years plus. That one is going to be not the most sensitive to rates, but close to the most sensitive. The the most sensitive is going to be zero coupon bonds, but. Um, but you can see that this drawdown, this chart, and then the next chart will show even further back. This is the largest drawdown since we've seen in the early 80s. So uh, just amazing, right? Um, and I think of note, you know, can't guarantee anything, of course, but uh, the last time this drawdown happened, you'll notice was right there before 1982, which happened to be the beginning of a long-term bull market in the United States. We'll see if that's the case again, and if the, if if bonds are signaling, you know, this massive run up uh, that kind of everybody's expecting, um, or if it's something different, and we're going to see the rates back off. You know, more and more, Chris, as we look at the data and kind of put it on our T chart, and then here's yet another chart, another data point that suggests that we're early on in a recovery, we're early on in a bull cycle, uh, versus you know this end of cycle type behavior. I mean, if you look at the charts, the only charts that really kind of say end of cycle is this weird call buying behavior and speculative behavior we're seeing out of the day trading crowd. Uh, yep. But all the other fundamentals are really pointing towards, hey, this is early stage. This is 2009, March of 2009 area. Yeah. This is prior to all those blow offs um, where we're actually going to see some run up in stocks. Let me just read what Rick Reader, who posted that chart, said. And Rick Reader is a fixed income portfolio manager for BlackRock, and he may be one of the biggest fixed income portfolio managers in the world, literally managing trillions of dollars. He said, we're in the midst of witnessing bond market history as the peak to trough drawdown for the Barclays Long Treasury Index now exceeds 20%, uh, not including today's move when he posted this. It's worst drawdown going back 40 years in meeting what may many consider to be a bear market. So interesting from a guy who would know. You know, Rick Reader, he's, um, I actually saw him speak once when I was in New York at a BlackRock event. Mm -hmm. And he's one of those guys that when he talks, you leave his speech and you're like, I'm not sure what he said, but what he said sounded really smart. <laughs> 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 Nice. I think I got pieces of all that, but yeah, he's a really smart man uh, and just his finger on the pulse for sure. Yeah. So treasury spread continued to widen. We saw, we saw what, 175 on the 10-year this week? We yep. backed off a bit, but we did see uh, above 175 on the 10-year, which 
uh, we're seeing another steepening basically. Um, but I think the next chart shows kind of zoomed out. This is the 10 year rate um, and the following one will show the 30 year rate and you can kind of see, uh, and I'm not sure why it's spaced out in the middle there, but longer term, you know, I think you could make an argument that this is just a short term up upturn, right, in rates, and that we could continue to see rates fall back off again, right? When you look at the 10 year, when you look at the 30 year, you've got that kind of long term channel. And we've had many of these times where the rates have spiked up a little bit and then just kind of kept going down, right? And if you listen to analysts like Lacey Hunt, who's been right for a long time, if you listen to, um, uh, Gary Schilling also been right for a very long time. Their argument is that this is just a short-term spike in rates and that we're going to continue to see lower rates. Um, I, I forget which one of them is calling for 0% on the 10-year. Um, and so that would be that would argue for deflation and not inflation. And, uh, and so if the bond market starts to signal that, that would be a huge, a huge shift. But as of right now, it seems like the market is... Re is responding to the anticipation of inflation and the higher rates. And we're seeing kind of a, a bit of a freak out in the market at the moment. Well, and that's why the Fed's saying, hold off. This is transient. We don't, we think yeah. this is, there's more likelihood of a deflationary. And these charts would certainly illustrate that, that, that it's, that's a downward trend. I, I'm a technical guy. I love looking at the charts and that's a downward trend, right? Yeah. And until we break that trend, we should expect that. What's interesting about this chart here. The 2% line on the 10-year treasury, we're not far off from that. But notice every time it went up above the 2% on the 10-year treasury, it didn't stay there long. Mm -hmm. And it That's got true. a pretty significant sell-off after each of those times. So I would say it's more likely this thing peaks its head up above 2% and we get a significant drop. That That's top. That's way I think the probabilities are in favor that 2% is top or somewhere in that region. Uh, so we might be at the end of the rate move. Interestingly enough, uh, rates in uh, real terms, if we go to, um, I think it's not this one, but there's a mortgage chart coming up that, you know, it really hasn't impacted the 30 year that much. Right. Yeah, you got it. Uh, but inflation is what everybody's talking about right now. So this is the Google search activity on what inflation means, basically what what asset classes respond well to it. I, I think you and I consume more investment, you know, talks than the average bear. And I would say it's a hundred percent consensus. There's maybe one or two people that I've, that I've heard expecting deflation, but they are very rare. Um, everybody's expecting inflation, especially in the short to medium term. So, but you know what lo markets love to do when everybody expects something that Boom. loves to just whack them right in the face yeah. to remember you know, markets will humble you. Uh, so stay humble before the markets because you never know. And, you know, when I'm hearing everybody scream inflation, I'm now starting to feel a little contrarian, actually, because I just feel like everybody is, which is weird for me because I have been screaming inflation. I've been seeing inflation. Yeah. I've been feeling inflation. But now that everybody's saying inflation, I'm kind of like, well, you know, maybe this is kind of like that whole bond debacle that never happened. Everybody starts yep. screaming the bonds are going to fall apart. They don't yep. because everybody's screaming it's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, along with those higher rates, we've seen a lot of volatility in the tech stocks. And this was a great chart uh, showing the the correlation between rates and uh, the NASDAQ, which doesn't hold all the time you know so if you research that kind of going back further that doesn't that doesn't always hold uh despite the whole argument about you know their longer term uh longer duration assets and so you'd expect uh them to be pulling back in terms of when rates go up however uh we're seeing more correlation than we've seen since uh the late 90s at the at the end of the tech bubble um is is really where this is starting to correlate to who knows? I'm not saying it's a tech bubble. That was a totally different market at that time. Uh, however, it does seem to be affecting them uh, along with that. What's interesting about this chart, Chris, if you overlaid the growth versus value stocks, I'm pretty sure you would have seen growth outperform value over that period of time. There's almost There would be almost an overlay. So it makes yep. me kind of wonder if growth might be done. Because yep. I don't know. The last couple of days, we seem to have seen a rotation back into growth uh, mm -hmm. in the markets. But is that, as the feds would say, transient? Or um, 
are we actually going to see that rally in value that it dearly needs to prove its worth in the portfolio? Right. Yeah. So th th this is just saying uh, that usually bubbles are pricked by tighter monetary monetary conditions, right? So basically, once you see some stress in the system, markets that are, tend to be overvalued, that's that's when you start to see a shift in in what's going on, right? So um, so oil in two thousand and five, remember that when when oil was what like one hundred and forty dollars a barrel is what it got up to, I think during. Uh, uh, the Bush era, um, mm -hmm. and and oil companies were like making money hand over fist, and everybody was saying, you know, oil is the place to be. Boy, totally different situation where we are today, right? Um, and then you've got the Nasdaq in two thousand. That was a, that was a huge shift. So the bottom portion is showing what was happening with with rates, uh, gold in the eighties, and then you see what happened to that uh, asset class that turned out to be a bubble at the time. So a lot of volatility in the NASDAQ, right? And so this is from Bespoke where they show daily moves of plus or minus 3% in the NASDAQ. And uh, we're, we're seeing in 2020 and 2021 kind of the same clusters that we saw during the great financial crisis and the bursting of the tech bubble. And so definitely some shifting going on in, in the environment within the market. What's interesting though is if you look back, 2009 was actually a pretty decent year for the stock market, right? So versus 08 wasn't, but 09 was. That was the recovery, right? So if we just say, okay, we got four of these kind of days because this quarter's over here in a few days, and we you kind of project that out, and we get the same kind of volatility the rest of the year in the NASDAQ, that would suggest that, again, another chart saying we're early recovery, and to expect volatility. And I think that's a really important take home uh, for listeners is that even during recoveries, you should expect volatility. That's part mm -hmm. of the game. And it just moves up and moves down and there's a lot of price discovery happening. Uh, because I think in this early stage of the game, it's hard for people to get their money going and invested, but it's really important to get it in and get going because that you wanna ride that recovery up. Absolutely. So high yield bonds um, can can be leaders again, you know, looking to the bond market to tell us what is happening, going to happen in the equity market, the, the quote unquote smart money. Now, the Fed's very active in the high yield market right now. So we'll see um, if that continues to play out. But I guess you could say uh, when they came in guns blazing last March, uh, actually a year ago today, um, is, is when they started being very, very active. And the market's been, the, the high yield market turned around first and then the stock market really followed along with it. I mean, it's, it's kind of uncanny how they have followed one another there. Well, and the reason that works is because if the Fed is investing high yield, which another name, that's like high yield is what people on the street call it. Um, what we should call it is junk. And this is stuff that's not likely to perform well, that if it wasn't backed by the government, uh, might default on us. And when you look at uh, the high yield doing so well, what that's doing is the Fed saying, look, we're going to buy all the junk. So that pushes what we call the risk curve out, and that pushes people's willingness to take risk to a higher level. So mm -hmm. people who are uh, educated investors will look at that and say, oh, okay, they're going to take the risky stuff. That means the not so risky stuff I can be even more risky with because yeah. they're covering the underneath risky stuff. And right. that's what you're seeing with IWM, with these small cap companies that you know, 30% of them are zombies, the high yield bonds, the high yield debt, uh, the junk stuff, the Fed is covering that. All of that is faith promoting to people mm -hmm. putting their money into the stock market to let it grow. Yeah, important distinction there. Uh, it, it, the government does not back high yield bonds, and they do not buy all of them. Uh, it's more of like they're it, they're active in the market, and you know, so don't yeah, you, listeners yeah, you don't, don't take away. Yeah, you don't want to just go buy every junk, but what it means yeah. is they're participating in the market. Yes, and yes. there's exchanges that they were participating in. You but assuming yeah. that you can just buy any piece of junk out there and the Fed's going to own it would be a mistake. Right, right. Thanks for that so, clarity. 
<laughs> yeah. kind of critical. We, we can be back and forth because we know what each other are talking. I'm just, you know. Uh, so anyway, so energy Let me tell companies. you what Darren didn't tell you, but what he really meant by what he said he was saying. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Exactly. Uh, so the energy stocks. So uh, Michael Venuto put this out and he just shows the, the energy sectors return precisely nothing for investors over the last 10 years. So this isn't so much to kick energy when it's down, but just to remind investors that this is a perfect example of why you never want to be concentrated in one asset class, no matter how good it seems at the time, because uh, there, there are multiple examples of this where asset classes, uh, certain stocks, certain bond, whatever, uh, are going to have no returns for 10 years. U.S. stocks had no return from 2000 until 2009. There was a lot of peaks and valleys between there, but that was a, a an almost 10 year period where there was zero return. And so no matter how great and how appealing an asset class seems and how great the story is, this is an argument for for diversification and why you never want to, you know, bet bet the farm on those YOLO bets uh, in one area. <laughs> What's interesting here, if you look at it from a chart perspective, we're back to a really important resistance point on this chart. So oil, energy, XLE, which is there's 11 sectors in the S&P and this is one of those sectors. It's got to clear it. So you want to see that clear come up. It's at a mission critical spot here to make it through this. Um, it definitely got rejected the past couple of days. Uh, so we'll see if it's going to have the strength to get through there. It might just potentially have that strength if people really start traveling again and feel confidence because of the vaccine. Absolutely. So growth versus value, this chart really does a great job, I think, kind of putting it in perspective of what we may be seeing shifting uh, below the surface. So another another argument for diversification, right, as a smart approach, uh, where you can see in 2000, just after 2006, growth started its 14-year outperformance cycle, right? And so just like in nature, trees don't grow to the sky. Um, you know, stocks are the same way in that these things cycle and sometimes the cycles are long sometimes they're short um and i'm in no way saying that these companies aren't great companies you know these tech companies are in some ways some of the best companies in the world but that's not where the story ends it also matters what investors are paying for those companies right and so if we're starting to see a shift in that the, and this starts to go back to a little bit of a mean reversion um, that could be a different story for the next decade. You know, so it's really this kind of, uh, we're at this, again, is value going to take off? Is growth going to really be a challenged um, investment here? Uh, but it's, it, you know, you can't help but argue somewhat in your mind that the, the guard has not changed. I know we always try to say like, hey, this time's different, right? And then that's always the kiss of death. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, you can't help but wonder if these tech conglomerates, like I was just listening to a, a, a YouTube this morning from the uh, St. Louis, Minneapolis Fed, and they were talking all about how Google has literally put every single book online so that you can search the books and they're doing research now and looking at like how often was I used, how often was we used and how has that changed over time? Which it's is amazing. just crazy, right? But so you think yeah. about, okay, this take Google and the fact that Google has gone on and done this and really created this unbelievable set of IP or this take Amazon that's really bridged every aspect of the 11 sectors in the S&P. And it's really difficult to argue that, hey, those FANG stocks, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google have not penetrated the economy in such a way and infiltrated the economy in such a way that there is really no uh, potentiality that they don't go up if the economy continues to improve because they're such a baseline part of our day-to-day -day lives. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas tech in the past has sold off or growth has sold off because uh, you know maybe it was less concentrated. But we've done such a horrible job, horrible job in the United States, um, of breaking up big companies using antitrust law. That would be one area where I'd say maybe you see tech really sell off, and then these value stocks actually do outperform. 
But it's very difficult right now to make that argument given how infiltrated all these tech companies are into our lives. Mm-hmm. All right, off that soapbox. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this this is one of the charts just showing uh, the cash levels are high, right? So, um, and it typically uh, seems to be a little bit of a reverse um correlation here right so like you look at the bottom of 2009 in the stock market was also the highest point in money in money market funds right and so this is one of the many many times where this recession is different you know this recession is different in that people's incomes went up not down especially the folks that were on the bottom end of that spectrum Um, and so now we're seeing this other thing where You've got the market at all-time highs, and you have people's cash piles at all-time highs, right? Again, so, going back to dry cake, dry powder in the keg, right? Yeah. And can this market keep going? Again, put it on the side of the T-chart. We're early stage. But, you know, Jim Grant on, on Real Vision had such a good point where he's talking about these are things you don't see in nature, right? You don't see negative interest rates in nature. And much like you don't see, you know, three-legged dogs and cats in the wild because nature wipes that out. But yet domestically, you know, people, you see them carting their dogs and cats around in little carts with, you know, hey, all kinds of... Hey, why are you going to hate on the dog and cat I'm not, I am not hating on it. I am simply <laughs> saying, you know, we're, we're in that situation from a monetary and fiscal perspective now where... We've fixed, we've patched up the dog and the cat so much that, you know, every time they leave the house, we're kind of like, is it going to be okay out there on its own for any period of time? Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those other signs that like we're in uncharted territory in terms of, you know, this, this wouldn't happen in nature. (laughs) Well, yeah. In nature, you wouldn't have 30% zombie companies in the Russell 2000 companies that literally are making no money. Yeah. Like in true nature of capitalism, that wouldn't yes. exist. Exactly. And I think your point's well taken, Chris, because it's it's at what point does the Fed let that nature aspect kick in and start weeding out some of these junky companies? I don't think they can. I think mm. they've already bitten off more than they can chew. And if they let one of those few of those handful of those companies start to fall and falter then I think it becomes a domino effect. Yeah. Well, they, they won't be able to see everything. You know, um, whenever somebody asks us to watch their animals, I'm like, I can't do that because you know what? My three-year-old will leave the door open. There's nothing I can do to to police her every second. And, and your animal will get out. And if they run away, I don't want to be responsible for it. So I kind of feel like that's the situation. Like, it's not, it's not a question of if something happens, it's just when. And we've already seen from the Fed that they never see these things coming ahead of time. They react to them after, after the fact, right? Well, I so. think you made a great point when we were talking earlier today. It's like, it's kind of crazy that we keep listening to what the Fed says, but they're always wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? And getting back to those behavior biases, we like to believe that there's, this, there's a, a behavioral bias called the illusion of control. And this idea that we're actually in control of things. So we all like hang to listen to the Fed thinking they actually do control everything. Yep. But reality is they got a long history of getting it wrong. Yeah. And and there's what's that other one that's like you have a, a premonition to follow those in authority, right? So if somebody yeah. like looks like Jay Powell or Janet Yellen, they're just they're very smart, very like respectful looking, and they just kind of look like what you would picture a banker to look like and that they know what they're talking about, right? And so, uh, Maybe anyway. Maybe that's why all the brokers wear suits and handkerchiefs. Could be. I never understood that. But yeah, well, we're trying the matching shirt phenomenon, so we'll see if that works. That's right. Uh, so gas demand, we finally went above what we were in uh, prior to COVID. So that was pretty, that was a significant step, um, you know, this last week. Makes you think that when earnings come out for the gas companies, that XLE should be do pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now we've got a series of charts about uh, about real estate, right? And how these prices all across the country are being driven by 
uh, the new work from home situation, uh, people moving to different places. You know, I think COVID was a, like you said, a big, a big gut check, gut check for people of like, Hey, you know, life is precious and short. And, you know, my, my family members are life is precious and short. I need to go be with them, those types of things. So it's driving these prices all over, wacky all over the place, uh, when it comes to real estate on top of that, um, you've got, um, uh, the situation with the interest rates, right? So real estate is, is driven heavily by borrowing. And so small changes in interest rates can make a major change in, in affordability uh, within properties. Um, and so you, you can definitely see that change as of March 1st last year when COVID started. I mean, that's just amazing how those were all moving together and then just totally split off, right? Yeah. And it goes back to this whole idea of K recovery, right? Yeah. And this bifurcation in people who receive benefits continue to be benefited from uh, the federal government stimulus. Yeah. So the density, everybody fl fled the urban areas. It'll be interesting to see if people go back, right? You know, if, if now that they're getting the vaccines and and now there's more of a sense of like we want to be around people again, if, if the urban's going to going to recover um what was really interesting i want to go back to the share of jobs that can be done from a home versus residential property prices right so dots are they represent 2400 zip codes aggregating to 20 points so each of these 20 points represents 2400 zip codes according to their share of jobs that can be done from home and so on this axis you see share of jobs that can be done from home and what's interesting is the jobs that can be done from home and where people live in homes, where they can do their jobs at home, uh, mm -hmm. fared much better during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. But also getting back, and I'll bet if you overlaid education and age onto this chart, that you would also see a similar pattern. And what's I think interesting about that is you get this Miami behavior where literally they're shutting down the streets because people are partying so hard and YOLOing so hard because they're just over it. And mm -hmm. again, going back to that fourth turning phenomenon, we see in this threat of institutions, this, this disgust with institutions, this undermining of institutions, there was a very big difference in how you experience COVID based upon your education level, your employment level, where you lived, your race, all those different factors impacted differently. So last spring, we saw all these riots and protests and Black Lives Matter aspects. We're starting to see some protests with the um, hate crimes against Asian communities. And, but we're also seeing a kind of the same side of the coin, but different behavior, which is this just hardcore, all in, no gas, just dive in partying happening across the nation in these party cities like Miami. And yeah. I think it's all of the same energy, right? It's the same energy of people just saying, you only live once, institutions are BS, they've been messing us over for years, Let's crush these hedge funds. Same kind mm -hmm. of vibe. Well, go go back to that last chart where it shows the preferred work from home days. You know, I think it's interesting that most people would That's actually uh, go uh, one more. I think after that, yeah, there you go. Oop, there, there. Okay. Back. No, no, back one. Sorry, there. <laughs> yeah. So people prefer to work from home. So this is another like, hey, I don't need the institution. I don't need a manager to be asking me every half an hour what I just did for the last half hour, which is the very institutional way uh, to to manage people. And now people are like, give me a project. Tell me what I need to have done. Measure the results, not the input, right? Don't tell me I need to be at my desk from eight to five, right? Because that mm -hmm. is, that's so like, you know, now people are like, just tell me what you need me to get done and I'll get it done whenever it works for me and my schedule, right? And I think that um, that has has proven to be, I would say, more effective for a lot of companies. Um, and, and, you know, so that kind of rise up against the institution in that, that sense, I think is probably going to be a, a more of an ongoing um, staple of our society. I don't know if you caught that headline where Goldman Sachs was kind of forcing all their employees back into the office. And then you had that employee put together this PowerPoint of these just like awful working conditions the traders have. Oh, uh, no. And, you know, it's the same kind of thing in these companies. Then he, they kind of backpedaled on it, right? Yeah. But also along with that, it's like the whole decentralized finance, DeFi, 
that's out there, right? And yep. why do we need these banks that have been ripping us all off? Why do we need the central banks ripping us all off? We can transact on a central digital currency where we can have proof of work concepts. So we know if people are hacking, we know if people are uh, scamming the system. That's another kind of similar perspective that's being um, pushed into the new global economy. So this Absolutely. is uh, this is looking at hours of productivity um, and down payment, medium existing home sales prices, uh, and hours of earnings. Uh, you know, you, we saw this huge shoot up, obviously, um, during COVID, and that continues to move, which is similar to what we saw right before the crash in 08. Right. And I forgot to put the sourcing on this one, but that's um, from George uh, Perkis. So uh, he posted this. Uh, He's and with so, Bespoke. Yeah. So credit credit to George. Sorry about uh, missing that. But I think that um, you know what we were talking about earlier is is working. Uh, you know, to drive prices up in the housing industry, you've got a lack of of workers. Right. You've got this huge demand for people that want new houses. Um, you've got interest rates starting to to go up, and so that's driving up the prices uh, in terms of um, or, or the amount of down payment that you're going to have to have, right? So it's and and you've got uh, on top of that a lot of people that haven't been working, and it's really difficult to get a loan if you don't have that that uh, income history. Well, if we and if we're seeing inflation, in everything else, but we're not seeing inflation in wages, which I talked about earlier this has a half-life like this is going to tire out here at some point yeah and and i don't know when but you know you we could see in real estate topping uh yeah. because of this mad rush we've had for houses we've had we have record low supply of um pre-owned homes out there right now mm -hmm. you have co uh, construction companies with really expensive costs of building because labor's tight materials are tight supply chains are strangled so mm -hmm. it's difficult to build houses. It's not easy. Then you take all the regulatory frameworks that have been put in place from the environmental movement, et cetera, good, bad, or indifferent, no comment, but it still constrains building. And mm -hmm. thus you have a perfect storm potentially brewing uh, in the housing uh, market that could resemble something to 08, especially if they lift the moratorium on foreclosures too soon. Right. So we've seen a pullback recently in the markets, and, and I think this chart does a great job of encapsulating the just massive gain starting from one year ago today in the S&P 500 um, and just how far outside on the, on the spectrum you know, that return was. That, that is absolutely not a, a normal, so it's not surprising to see a bit of a, a pullback and a reversion of the mean. So... Um, so that, that is the largest one-year trailing return in the index's history, according to S&P. So, and then Charlie Biello had this great chart, which showed that, you know, like you were saying earlier, Darren, volatility is a, is a feature of the markets. It's not a bug, it's a feature. So if you want those gains, um, you have to be able to stomach the losses as well. So he said... But they're only paper losses unless you sell, and that's the point. Well, yes, but when you see them in your, in your own account, uh, it's, it can be more than just a paper loss, right, in the feeling that you get. But uh, True. but you're you're right. So the S and P uh, is up six hundred and forty two percent since March of two thousand and nine, uh, and he says easy money. Not exactly. There were twenty eight corrections during that time, more than five percent, which is about where we are right now, I believe. Um, of these, ten were larger than ten percent, and three exceeded twenty percent, and one, the one we just went through last March, was more than thirty percent. Uh, and, and he says, they all seem like the end of the world at the time, which is definitely true. So, and there's the reasons over to the side, which a lot of us don't remember half of these reasons when you get back, you know, beyond mm -hmm. a few months. What always cracks me up about these reasons, it's like the market falls and then we're scrambling. Like today, we did the same thing. We're like, why, what was going wrong? Like, what did the Fed say today that sold off the markets? And we're looking at all the headlines and what the... Janet Yellen and Jerem Powell were talking this morning uh, to Congress this morning or in, on a panel or whatever. And, you know, we're all scrambling around trying to find what's the reason. And 
at the end of the day, like nobody really knows. Like it could be a host of hundreds of thousands of reasons. Absolutely. Yep. So a lot of money in bank accounts right now, close to uh, between 15, 14 and $16 trillion uh, sitting, sitting in FDIC insured banks at the moment. So a lot of money, a lot of money. Dry powder. Yeah, $16 trillion. And just to give you an idea, what's the total GDP of the U.S. is right around that. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'd have to look it up, but it's between... It's definitely not higher than 25, and I don't think it's lower than 16, so it's right around in there. So that is a lot of, of dough, you know, uh, sitting on the side. So uh, where did all that money come from, though, Darren? <laughs> I don't know. Where, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> deficits, huge, massive, unbelievably large deficits. Uh, so you can see 2020 compared to prior years and then where we are so far in 2021 uh, off the charts deficit. So this is like current spending versus current income, right, for the government. Um, and, Can you, you imagine know, though, Chris, if they hadn't done all this deficit spending, like it would have been oh, so bad. It would have been so bad. Armageddon, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Economic collapse. Like totally. they had to do it, but still when you look at this, you're like, oh, we just yeah. mortgaged our future. Yes, absolutely. Like us, our kids, their kids, and their kids, and their kids, and their kids, if we're still around and haven't killed ourselves off, um, we'll be dealing with this. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so first five months so far of 2021, just massive deficits. Our overall debt, which you'll see on the next one, and this will show public debt, household debt. Um, so according to the Fed's latest Z1 data, total U.S. debt, debt late 2020, so this is before we even just did the most recent one, was $83.5 trillion. Uh, U.S. public debt, which is federal and state, accounted for $26.8 trillion of that. So total U.S. debt to GDP is now at 399%, and public debt to GDP was at 128 And again, this is at the end of 2020, so it doesn't include this latest round. This is why you always hear me say fiscal conservatives don't exist anymore. Nope. If they do, they're delusional. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it just doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. So we're at public debt to GDP, not seen since the end of World War II. Um, and we didn't uh, this get is... any like roads out of it or anything. You know, no. like that's the thing. Like I, I feel like it was so irresponsibly done. Like there's, yeah, they had to do it, but I think it could have been done with a better eye for the future. Like let's, let's set ourselves in a better place for the future. Um, that's mm. at least while I know a lot of people are pushing back on uh, the Biden administration starting to push this $3 trillion uh, infrastructure, but it, like, at least we get better roads. <laughs> you just spent a lot and what do we have to show for it? May, right. Economy still float, I guess, would be the argument. Absolutely. So, well, if, there, if you're thinking, well, we can just raise taxes on the rich, well, I got news for you. If if you make about between a hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars a year, those folks are already paying most of the taxes, right? And so there's a huge portion, uh, you know, and and you probably can't tax the bottom much more than they're already being taxed because we've already been over that a million times. There's they can barely stay afloat. They're paycheck to paycheck. They have no savings uh, to begin with. Um, but how do you tax? How do you tax the rich more, right? And so, I think we come back to the to the starting point of, look, there's no way to tax and pay this off. The only way that they can get all of this debt taken care of is through inflation and financial repression. And this is not just a U.S. story; it's a global story. Yeah, you're not you're not going to reset this by taxing all the productive citizens in society too, yeah. right? You're yeah. just not. And you're going to, like in California, people are looking at staring down, you know, 60 to 70% taxes, depending on what your situation is. And people are just going to move. And right. they just are. And that's just a reality. It's the same story I hear all the time when people say, oh, just shut down Bitcoin. Like you can do that, but people are just going to move and the country's mm-hmm. going to miss out on that. Mm-hmm. So we're not spend a ton of time on this chart. This is just showing the the momentum factor that we're probably going to see some more uh, volatility in that. So what mo- momentum looks at is the prices of certain stocks over the last one month, three months, six months, sometimes a year. 
those are going to start rotating out of the tech stocks, which had done so well, and into some of these other performers uh, that have done done well, uh, which is probably going to drive that circle even further as those momentum funds start rotating out of tech and into some of the other areas that, that have been doing well of late. You heard me earlier talk about how the 30-year mortgage rate, even though we're sort of capping out, I think, or getting close to on the 10-year, uh, you know, really hasn't. I mean, it's gone up, but not astronomically by any means or stretch the imagination. A lot of gap between that uh, mortgage rate and those those real rates, though, the treasury well, rates. That's what sh that, that shows you, you know, where there's some yield curve control in play already. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If they let those rates float up to natural rates, it'd crush the real estate market. Just yeah. Crush it. So, so this is from Liz Ann Saunders at Schwab. Big miss for Feb February home sales down 18.2% versus 5.7% estimated um, and 3.2% in the prior month. So monthly drop was the worst since 2013, uh, yet the median new home price is up 5.3% year over year to 349,000. So uh, lots going on in the real estate market these days. Um, and I think the housing starts, I mean, if you look at this on a longer term chart, really you can't, you can't tell too much of a difference. You know, it's not like the housing starts just fell off a, a cliff compared to where it kind of normally fluctuates, it seems like. Yeah, these downs are seasonal. I mean, you can just see that by looking at the chart. You got 17, they're down around this time of year. 18, they go up the first part, down. The, you know, I mean, this time of year looks a little quiet. Um, and this is going to be a little bit lagging, right? Because we're going into spring, it'll kick in more. Uh, so right. I wouldn't be too concerned, but I but I do hear from developer clients and from people who are in the trades that there's a shortage of people, shortage of supplies, hard to get stuff. There's big lags on ordering stuff if you can get it. Yep. So if you made me president for a day, Darren, I would uh, I would encourage publicly traded companies. I think that the leaders of those companies should be required to keep a certain percentage of their overall net worth in their company Amen. and not only in their company for while they're there, but also for, say, three to five years after they leave um, to really put some skin in the game for the top brass. Um, and, and I think that that would be great for society. I think it would be great for markets. Um, and, and, you know, here's some data to back it up where when you get founder led companies, which they they have more of a tie to that company, they're not just a rent seeking type of manager. Um, those those companies outperform uh, other companies for obvious reasons. So oil, yeah, yeah. So oil market is, um, so there's, there's contango and there's backwardation within the futures market. So oils flipped into contango, at least for the short end of the futures curve for the first time since December. Explain that to people who don't understand it because they're kind of weird terms. So it's basically like, you know, you would expect that, um, oil uh, further out is going to is going to be more expensive because you got to store it and find it etc you wouldn't expect it to be uh, more expensive in the short term than it would be in the long term so uh, so when it, so it's saying this is a sign that traders are getting worried about the demand outlook um, as the virus cases accelerate again at least that's the story so we'll see if that ends up playing out um, we talked a little bit about the the lockdowns in in europe and these other variants going around is kind of a race to get everybody vaccinated in time um, who knows I, I think we're both on the same page that it would be really tough to go back to lockdowns at this point i don't think in the u.s anyone would listen to them. <laughs> yeah like oh i mean is newsom really going to come out and say everybody lock down and i'm going to lose my re-election because he's going to have to get re-elected again because it sounds like they have enough signatures and you know there's no political will to do that <laughs> like mm -hmm. like you would just i don't think he's um, really all about the people. I think he's a very self-interested human being. And so I cannot imagine saying, I know I'm going to lose this election, but for the good of the Californians, we need to lock back down. Don't see that happening. His mm -hmm. political career is much more important to him, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So important to keep an open mind about different asset classes. This was posted by Tracy Alloway from Bloomberg. 
And uh, this was, I think, from Goldman Sachs, actually, and they're comparing Bitcoin to previous uh, bubbles, right? And there's definitely some folks out there that would that would say Bitcoin is in a bubble. I, I uh, It's one of those things that's really hard to tell when you're in the midst of one, though, right? I absolutely think that Bitcoin is going to blow off like a bubble and everybody's going to scream, see, it's a bubble. But what they don't realize is that it's following a halving cycle. And I showed that chart last week. This was another chart that came across this week and it's called decreasing liquid supply of BTC Bitcoin versus increasing liquid supply. So what happens is during these sell-off periods, people flood their Bitcoin onto exchanges and don't hold it in hard wallets um, or cold storage as we call it. When people are pulling it off of the exchanges, that constrains supply and that can help push price higher. This is the um, stock to flow um, price of Bitcoin. And what stock to flow is, is just saying how much of it's coming on the market versus how much of it is on the market. And what we've seen at, is as Bitcoin gets halved, so that means every four years or so, the um, number of Bitcoins coming on on a daily basis to be able to, people can buy on exchanges gets cut in half because the mining process gets more expensive. And it's following very closely the stock to flow. So as long as Bitcoin keeps being Bitcoin, then we should continue to see these cycles. Well, you can see this was the first um, blow off from the early stages of the halving. Second one, third one. We're expecting the same thing again. Like we think that will happen. It will likely happen towards the fall of this year. And when that blows off, it'll sell off and you'll see all the media go, ah, see, I told you it was a bubble. It'll go down and 15 months before the next halving, it will start to build again. And that's what we've seen the last three cycles. Now, there's a very real possibility that it doesn't continue that pattern, but that's at least the pattern it's continued so far. Uh, and you can see that in this process and where we are in that days prior to the all-time high and where we are in the halving cycle you can see we're still um, got a ways to go uh, this one was from december so um, we're a little bit closer now but more or less there's still quite a bit of runway left this i thought was an interesting chart and part of what drives the price of bitcoin is there's only 21 million out there and because there's only 21 million um, bitcoin out there there's only so many and as we get closer and closer to that 21 million being mined and in circulation there's more and more scarcity to it so if we're having what's coming on to the market and there's scarcity of it that's what creates the commodity like aspect to bitcoin do i think it's a currency do i think it's you know going to revolutionize the world no it's probably going to be something in between i think it's going to be an asset class that people use to protect their assets because it it offers something that isn't correlated because we all know that the bond and stock market um, have acted very correlated lately um, in any sell-off so we're always looking for these different asset classes that behave differently so that is a wrap for this week. A few minutes over this week, we got through a lot of charts. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate each of you. Um, as a reminder, this is for educational purposes only. Um, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe. Um, if you turn on your notifications, you'll be notified when we do go live. We'll be back with you Friday for On The Markets where we talk all about the charts and everything else nerdy we didn't talk about today. Have a good one.